Facebook doesn't use Git. And the story for why is really interesting. It's so interesting that I've been begging all of my current and ex-Facebook friends to try and document it so I could talk about it more. And thankfully, one of our channel sponsors, Graphite, was overqualified to go in depth on this. Huge shout out to them for sponsoring this video, writing this article, and making this concept possible because I've wanted to film this since like June of last year. And I've been interested in Facebook's history with Git and other version control stuff since way, way before then. So yes, this video is sponsored. That does not mean they have any control of what I say. They wrote an article because I asked them to, and I can give my honest thoughts and feedback on it. But let's dive in to why Facebook doesn't use Git. Written by Greg Foster. First, why I care. I work on building Graphite, which is fundamentally inspired by internal Facebook tooling. In case you guys didn't know this, Graphite was built because a lot of ex-Facebook engineers missed the way that version control and management worked at Facebook, specifically the idea of stacked diffs. Really interesting stuff, and it's cool to see people like Greg leave to build something better. When I set out to create a startup with friends, I'd never heard of Mercurial. Why can't I pronounce Mercurial? That's a weird word to say. I've only really read it. But Mercurial was an alternative to Git way back in the day. Mercurial, SVN, and Git were like the three. Despite being passionate about all things in DevTools, he'd never heard of it. My previous engineering experience has included personal projects, college homework, iOS dev at Google, and info dev at Airbnb. Throughout my life, Git was as common as water. It was so common, in fact, that I assumed it was the only viable tool for creating and managing code changes. Funny enough, Mercurial expert Gregory Zorak, Zork? Whatever. I'm so sorry, Greg. Sat a few seats away from me at Airbnb, though I only knew him as kind of a desk mate and knew nothing of his contributions. In 2021, my teammates Thomas and Nick opened my mind. They came from Facebook and, to my surprise, hardly knew Git. Instead, they were deeply trained on Mercurial patterns in Facebook's Stack Diffs workflow. Over time, they sold me on the benefits of non-Git tooling and patterns, and we ended up making an early company pivot to bring Stack Diffs to GitHub developers. In the process, we made a CLI that incorporated the ideas from HG into Git. This post is not about our startup. Rather, it's about the root question that has nagged me over the last three years. Why do Facebookers, MetaMates, or whatever you want to call them now, not use Git? Why adopt Mercurial instead and build custom workflows on top of it? I know Google doesn't use Git, but that makes sense. Google's engineering predates Git by over five years. Facebook, on the other hand, was founded at the same time that Git was created in 2004. And by that time, Facebook was seriously evaluating source control tooling. Git was more popular than Mercurial. So why did Facebook not use Git? The question is niche, but I think it's a fun one to consider. If Facebook had leaned into Git and contributed back in the 2010s, the engineering world might have looked entirely different. Git may be more user-friendly and might natively support stack changes. GitHub might have developed better support for closed source software development. Early ex-Facebook companies like Uber and Pinterest might have also used Git and GitHub as their source control rather than Fabricator and Mercurial, leaning to a less fragmented ecosystem over the last decade. I actually didn't know that Uber and Pinterest were both on Mercurial and Fabricator. Good to know. But Facebook didn't stick with Git, for their primary monitors at the very least. Instead, they adopted Mercurial for their version control and incrementally added custom tooling on top. Why? First, I tried Googling the answer and found the following definitive blog post. This is over 10 years old now. Scaling Mercurial at Facebook. This isn't even about the why, this is about the how. Cool that this exists though, and that even though it's 10 years old, it's still publicly available on the Engineering at Meta blog. The 10-year-old write-up, along with some later YouTube tech talks, gave me a starting answer. Because performance. Interesting. Let's hear more. But I wanted to go deeper and hear from the original deciding engineers. With help of a teammate, I posted a question on an ex-Facebooker group asking about the history. I also cold emailed two of the original engineers working on the project to migrate onto Mercurial. They were kind enough to call me off the record and give personal accounts of the project. This is why I'm so hyped. I could have made this video a year ago when I was first thinking about it, but I didn't have any of these connections. I had a couple people at Meta that I could have talked to, but nobody who was there actively working on the decision to not use Git. These guys are some of the most qualified people to write this blog post, and I'm so lucky they did so I could be paid to sit here and talk to y'all about it. Here is what I was able to learn as the full reason behind not using Git at Facebook. Hopefully, this post can help further document the history behind why our tools in 2024 are the way that they are. Note. I never worked at Facebook, and this account is my best understanding of the facts as someone who wasn't there themselves. I was able to speak to a few people who worked on the project and received their permission to write about what they explained to me. I thought Greg was at Facebook before. I guess not. There are a ton of ex-Facebookers at Graphite, though, so just because he's not doesn't mean he doesn't have access to all of these resources. He's very qualified for this. So, enough of the preamble. Why did Facebook migrate off of Git? According to the 2014 Facebook blog post, they started out on Git. As one would expect, it was the default choice at the time for source control systems. But around 2012, they started hitting scaling limits. The post claims their code base was, quote, many times larger than even the Linux kernel, which checked in at 17 million lines of code and 44,000 files. Specifically, Git operations started feeling slow for engineers. Not cripplingly slow, but slow enough to warrant investigation. 
The key bottleneck was the process of statting all of the files. Git examines every file and naturally becomes slower and slower as the number of files increases. The engineers tried running a simulation, creating a dummy repo that matched the expected scale of Facebook's code base in a few years. The result was horrifying. Basic Git commands took over 45 minutes to complete. That's really cool. They ran a simulation trying to fake what it would look like for the code base to keep growing just to see what the performance looks like. Nuts. In the words of an original engineer on the project, quote, it's not the type of thing you would want to leave until all of your engineers are complaining. By that point, the thing would be too unwieldy. Trying to do damage control, much less just trying to clean it up and make a proper new solution, that would be a Herculean effort. And yeah, I agree. As they're pointing out here, the amount of effort to make Git scale the ways they need it to would have been Herculean, to say the least. And it was, because it took another five to seven years before, of all companies, Microsoft jumped on it. And made Git scale. <laughs> this is probably worth its own whole video because it's fascinating the things that the Microsoft teams did to make Git scale, both because they had acquired GitHub and wanted to lean into that, but also their existing version control solutions were shit and they wanted to lean into existing open source tools instead. But the tools weren't good enough for a lot of the things they needed, specifically the number of files, a some amount, more importantly, the size of the files. The files in the code base for Windows were insane. One of the many things that they had to do in order to make this work was introduce LFS, which is large file systems for Git. It's a virtual layer where you can handle the large files externally, but bind it to Git effectively. It's it's chaos. It's going to be really hard for me to explain in brief, but if you're interested in Git LFS, in scaling Git at Microsoft, and all of the things that one of the biggest, if not the biggest company in the world had to do to make this viable, let me know and I'll do a dedicated video on that. But we're talking about the route that Facebook took before Microsoft had invested in all of these things, and we can question the validity of those investments as well, but I want to hear how they worked around it differently. So, a ragtag group of software engineers got to work investigating solutions. First, they contacted the Git maintainers to see what it would take to extend Git to support larger monorepos better. Here are some choice quotes from an email thread with the Git maintainers. It's 12 years later, and yet I still feel somewhat frustrated reading these messages. Sounds like you have everything in a single .git. Split up the massive repositories to separate smaller .git repositories. Ugh, I don't love this already. While you can do this, it's not a good idea. You should split up repositories. I concur. I'm working in a company with many years of development history with several huge CVS repos, and we are slowly but surely migrating the code base from CVS to Git. Split the things up. This will allow you to reorganize things better, and there is, IMHO, no downsides. <laughs> there are downsides. You, you now can't synchronize versions between things without building your own external system. Ideally, you should have one thing you can clone that has all of the different services that you run and all of the things that they need to run. The magic of a mono repo isn't that everything's in one place, so it's more convenient to download. It's that everything's in sync. So if one thing changes and it affects other things, all of the affected services are in one place. I can't tell you how much time I lost at Twitch because the backend services that provided data for the APIs, the backend API itself, which was a GraphQL edge, and then the front end that we actually consumed everything in, those were three different repos that had an entirely different like paths for contribution, SLAs for merges and everything in between. So I'd have to propose a schema change to the GraphQL Edge team, get them to approve it, go implement that on the API side, get both far enough to merge, link them together by getting both out and making sure that their versions sync because everything's just managed with versioning with numbers that we create ourselves. And then once that's all deployed, I can finally consume it on the front end. So that's a bunch of steps before I could even start actually working on the project. Whereas in a mono repo, I could have one PR that does all of that. And once you hit the merge button, everything gets applied at once. Mono repos, when you're working on features that span multiple parts of your infrastructure, make life significantly easier. And a pull request shouldn't be enabling a feature to build somewhere else in another repo. Ideally, a pull request is enabling the feature itself. Anyways. While Git could be better with large repositories, in particular applying commits in an interactive rebase seems to slow down on bigger repos. There's only so much you can do about statting 1.3 million files. Yeah, there is, and we can do a lot. The response wasn't cooperative, nor has it aged well in a future full of large mono repos. Even just for like Go, like, like Go the language does not compute with these things where you're committing the binaries themselves and not the binaries, but the code that you're downloading when you use packages. There's a lot of reasons that most of these quotes age poorly. The Git maintainers pushed back on improving performance and instead recommended that Facebook shard their mono repo into many parts. However, sharding was a non-starter for the Facebook team, and they recounted being surprised by Git's unwillingness to be extended. Traditionally, being offered free open source labor by a major tech company is a well-received gift that can ensure a long life for projects. And this is again why like Microsoft was eventually accepted as they tried to make these changes, but at the time, the Git team did not seem interested. 
That being said, the Git project was under no obligation to bend to Facebook's asks. I don't intend to paint them as the bad guys of this story. Doing something because Facebook asked you to is no way to live one's life. Insert a React joke. Interestingly, the Git maintainers appear to change their tone two years later, after seeing Facebook contribute back meaningful improvements to Mercurial. They mailed the list about performance issues in Git. From what I saw, there was relatively little feedback. I had the impression, and I would not be surprised if they had the impression, that the Git development community is relatively unconcerned about performance issues on larger repos. So the question is, if the Git community is interested in being competitive in such large-scale scenarios, something what Mercurial seems to be doing now, out of the box. Yeah. Funny enough, I didn't think of it this way before, but it makes a ton of sense. Facebook being denied collaboration with the Git team, moving on to Mercurial where they could actually make it scale, seems to be the inciting moment that enabled Microsoft of all companies to end up becoming a big contributor to Git and owning GitHub. Like the order of events that led to Microsoft's Git contributions arguably started here. Really interesting. A decade later, Git has made significant improvements to support monorepos better. For what it's worth, the situation has changed pretty drastically today. Git now, with some knowledge of how to do it, operates well within really large repos, finally. Alternatives considered. Alternatives to Git in 2012 were scarce. To be fair, they're kind of scarce now. The team considered the closed source Perforce, Google's former source control solution. In an early investigation call with the Perforce sales engineers, Facebook pointed out an architectural flaw in Perforce's local consistency between reader and writer nodes. The response didn't instill confidence. The sales engineers weren't aware of the fundamental issue and had no roadmap plans to address it. I know basically nothing about Perforce, and I could look into it to give you guys a better description, but I'm going to not do that because I don't care that much. Let me know in the comments if I should have. Further solutions, like BitKeeper, were considered. I know a bit more about BitKeeper, though. But thankfully here, all of these were disqualified. The last remaining option was Mercurial. It had performance similar to Git, but had a cleaner architecture. Where Git was a complex web of bash and C code, Mercurial was engineered in Python using object-oriented code patterns, and it was designed to be extensible. I didn't know Mercurial was in Python. Fascinating. I've seen more and more things using Python with surprising performance. Another fun one, we're talking to these guys a lot more lately, EdgeDB. Believe it or not, this database that is technically built on top of Postgres with its own query language system, binary, everything on top. It's super performant. I'll scroll the benchmarks. Like compared to all these other TypeScript ORMs, EdgeDB just does significantly more iterations per second. They have a whole section about their benchmarks, even though it's built in Python. Python is not a fast language, but Python has fast bindings to things. And if you use Python as like a C orchestrator, you can make things really fast. It almost reminds me of React Native, where React Native seems like it'll be slow because it's all JavaScript, but it's not all JavaScript. It's JavaScript telling the native platform what to do. And when you have an abstraction that might be slow, but it's just calling the faster things, it ends up performing great. And it's cool to see everything from Mercurial to databases using Python as like an orchestration layer that doesn't seem to hurt their performance. One of the investigating engineers had strong former experience with Mercurial, and the team decided to attend a Mercurial hackathon in Amsterdam to further investigate. And because I had a lot of prior association with Mercurial, I bent over backwards to pursue every possible alternative before even putting Mercurial on the table. This is from someone who actually helped make these decisions over at Facebook. Fascinating to see that because they had used it before, they actually tried to not use it again. <laughs> What they found was a system that was easy to extend and a community of maintainers who were impressively welcoming to aggressive changes by the Facebook team. I think this was the specific hackathon mentioned, but I'm not positive. Some real early 2010s vibes. I, I'll take a look, but I'm scared. This is so early 2010s, holy shit. Yeah, I don't wanna dick through that. Appreciate you, Greg, for doing it for us. Migrating the whole engineering org. After the Amsterdam hackathon, the Facebook team was convinced. All that remained was convincing the rest of the company of the migration. That was an intimidating task. Engineers can be extremely sensitive about tooling changes. Imagine Vim versus Emacs. And changing source control systems is a big deal. Yeah, I don't want to be the person telling Facebook, hey, by the way, we're not using Git anymore. Terrifying. The team set out as smoothly as possible, so as not to trigger defensive responses from the other engineers. What ensued sounds like a masterclass in internal dev tools migrations. The team spent months socializing the possibilities of migrating to Mercurial, and took the time to map all common commands and workflows between Git and Mercurial. This is another really interesting thing about Facebook culture. I haven't seen other companies do this much, where there's a change that they know is controversial, or an advocate internally that is building something that is challenging the norm, both internally and externally. And rather than just do it and hope people will forgive them, which often fails, they go out of their way to, within Facebook, build support. This is also how React succeeded. If you've seen the React documentary, you know a lot of what made React work was the effort that the original React developers put in to advocating internally to convince other teams to stop 
weird framework alternative number five and try this new pattern that looked terrifying and different, but actually made much more maintainable code. And that internal advocacy ends up being a really strong way to test out tools and solutions because the bar for who you're convincing is much higher. And obviously, like my audience has a decently high bar. Over 80% of y'all are 25 and older, which is great. I love that. But at a company, you have to pass an interview and then survive for a while. And once you're a leader on a team that makes these decisions, the bar has gotten really high. So if you get good enough at explaining the thing you're doing to convince those types of higher ups with a ton of experience, you've now made a rock solid pitch that once it goes public and reaches the real world has a much higher chance of success. There's also something like StyleX one, where StyleX worked really hard to convince people internally, hey, this is a way of building styles that feels different, but is way more maintainable for the problems we're solving. And once they got good enough at convincing people internally, they open sourced it, released it externally, and it was immediately a hype machine that was really hard to poke holes in because those holes had already been poked internally. And that's something that I don't see at many companies other than Facebook. In fact, I'd say most companies, they open source things that weren't liked internally, not the ones that they advocated for internally. Really cool to see. As I say here, they went so far as to source the frequency of specific Git commands run across the company and specifically document how the most frequent operations would work in Mercurial instead. That's really cool. Secondly, they created opportunities for developers to voice their concerns and discuss any edge cases that might be tricky in the new system. Going in, the team assumed they get bogged down in flame wars over the obtuse eight-way octopus merge hypotheticals. But to their surprise, they found their peer engineers to be accommodating and friendly. Quote, no one stood up and started screaming about their special situation. That's cool to hear. Not sure if this would happen nowadays where people like to scream a little bit more, but uh, cool to hear, especially at Facebook at the time, they were able to push this through. Finally, they committed to the migration and cut the company over to Mercurial. The rest is history. Facebook contributed performance improvements to Mercurial, making it the best option for large mono repos. Evan Priestley extended Fabricator to support Mercurial. That's cool. I didn't know Fabricator now works with Mercurial. Facebook leveraged Mercurial's concept of diffs to create a pattern of stacking. Cool that they actually made this. I didn't know stacked diffs was an invented by Facebook thing. I actually thought that was part of Mercurial's like recommended workflow initially. But this unlocked a new level of novel code review parallelization. Huge, huge stuff. If you guys aren't already familiar with the graphite bit, yeah, we'll talk about graphite in a bit. Don't worry. Ex-Facebookers left to new companies and brought their workflow with them, creating a small but vocal cult of stack diff enthusiasts. And this is the reason I really wanted to do this. Stack diffs, when I first heard about the idea, broke my brain. I wanted to understand them better. And I've spent the last, I don't know, five years trying to figure out all the ways people use them and all the things you can do. And the first time I've actually been able to use it myself has been graphite. Finally, I met some of those enthusiasts and decided to dedicate my 20s to bringing mercurial style stack diffs to Git and GitHub. In case you guys don't know what's so cool about graphite and stack diffs, I've talked about this in a few other videos. I have one other video about big PRs coming out very soon, if it's not already out, where I go in depth on all of the coolness with stack diffs. The key concept with stack diffs is you build on top of existing diffs. It's like branching off of a PR to make another PR, but once all of them are approved, they can all merge together at once. You don't have to worry about squashing, breaking your diffs when you branch off of things. It makes it way easier to do multiple things in parallel and have it all come together in the end. It's been a much better experience for a team like mine that moves really fast, even with a small number of engineers. So it's so cool seeing these workflows that worked at Facebook being brought out. Closing thoughts from the Graphite guys. What's the takeaway from this story? Reflecting on the quotes and interviews, I'm reminded of the classic wisdom that so many of history's key technical decisions are human-driven, not technology-driven. This is really cool too. Like, technically speaking, they could have done these same things to Git that they ended up doing to Mercurial. But the human aspect of the original Git maintainers not wanting to do that ended up resulting in a whole separate world of version control existing. Like, if it wasn't for the quotes earlier on here where the Git team was skeptical of large repos, Mercurial would actually be dead now, almost certainly. These messages from the original Git maintainers have kept alive alternatives, which is a crazy thought because that was not their goal here. Their goal here was to make light recommendations of, hey, we don't think that's a great pattern, smaller repos if you can. And by thinking in that way and by pushing back in this way, it left room for a whole separate world to exist. Facebook didn't adopt Mercurial because it was more performant than Git. They adopted it because the maintainers and code base felt more open to collaboration. Facebook engineers met face-to-face -face with Mercurial maintainers and liked the idea of partnering. When it came to persuading the whole engineering org, the decision got buy-in due to thoughtful communication, not because one technology was strictly better than another. Again, huge call-outs. Like, this whole arc was around communication and the human aspect, not the technical superiority of one solution or the other. The technical stuff would follow, but it followed after the human aspect was resolved. For all of those reading this, I think this was Brian's true brilliance in getting Mercurial adopted at Facebook and something people should consider when bringing a new technology to a company. 
Kindness and openness go far in the world of dev tools, and I aim to carry on these values as I contribute to the history of source control. This was phenomenal. I am pumped I finally got to tell this story, and I learned a bunch here as well. What do you guys think, though? Are you now more curious about Mercurial, or maybe you're going to try a stack diff workflow? This was a crazy history, and I certainly didn't expect it to go the way it did. Thanks again, and one last huge shout out to Graphite for sponsoring this, writing this article, and making this video possible. Appreciate you all a ton. Until next time, peace nerds.